right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, those of you that are putting in the chat where you're from. Our timer did go off, so to be respectful um, to your guys' time this morning, we're going to have a message from our moderator. Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's morning session of the seventh annual Google Camp Conference. My name is Isamad, and I will be your moderator tech for this session. I'm here to provide you with virtual support for both you and the presenter during this presentation. And should you have any questions or if you need assistance with the Zoom interface, you can send me, um, you can use the chat icon on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just search for moderator and send me a direct message and I'll do my best to provide you uh, with assistance or to resolve your concern. And now to announce this morning's session, digitizing graphic organizers presented to you by Taylor Barraza. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this morning for our presentation, I'm going to put the link in the chat if you didn't get a chance to get it from the SCED. Um, I'd like you to follow along with me first, but if you want to be able to get back to it and you're worried about not getting those slides, I just put it in for you and I'll put it in at the end as well. All right. Uh, so digitizing graphic organizers. Um, we all know that everything digital has become really important, um, whether you are back in the classroom or not. So I'm really excited to get going with this uh, presentation. At any time, if you guys do have any questions, you can put it in the chat. Um, if it is relevant, I will take a moment to pause and go over it. If I do glance over it, I'll come back to it at the end of the session. So I will give you guys the ability to unmute so far if uh, if it is really relevant, but I will ask that you guys stay muted otherwise. Um, and welcome, my name is Taylor Barraza. Um, I have my email up there and my Twitter for those of you that want to get connected. Um, I am mostly an elementary level teacher. Uh, we do go up to sixth grade. I've taught first, fifth, sixth, second, and this year I'll actually be switching to third grade. So you'll see a different variety of applications here. I did see that there was some high school level people in here. So I'm excited to see um, what everybody thinks as far as relating it to their content. So some teachers still are wondering why should we go digital? Now that we're back in person, handwriting is so important. And I absolutely agree as a lower uh, grade teacher. Now, I think it's important though to do both handwriting and digital. So we need to have that good balance. And when we're thinking about that, we wanna explore uh, the benefits. So some of the things is developing that digital literacy, um, just feeling comfortable with being on their computers, on their Chromebooks. Also the importance of collaboration, um, rather than having to wait their turn to share a piece of poster paper, they can actually collaborate live at the same time on these digital graphic organizers uh, and also edit each other's work. Now, also, the nice thing is there's no more I lost my work. And then for us as teachers, it provides a lot of opportunities to differentiate our expectations uh, based on assignments if we do it digitally. See, I'm gonna, there we go. Also, it provides us a chance to do some diagnostic comments during the process. In the moment, we can see what they're doing live and make a comment rather than waiting for them to hand in our paper. And then finally, it's an easy way for us to use formative assessments when we're in our PLCs and we always have those student examples to go back to each year. So I just wanna go over what some graphic organizers will look like. Um, if you in the chat are a school that is thinking maps, I'd love to know that. I came from a school district that was heavy in thinking maps. I know um, AVID has a lot of different graphic organizers as well. Uh, we have Write from the Beginning and Beyond, and Step Up to Writing is what I've been familiar with. So if you want to throw in any of your writing curriculum as it relates, that'd be really interesting to see. So some of the examples that we can see when students start to engage with digital graphic organizers, this is a first grade example. Uh, one of the benefits is easy movement for labels. We have a can have our map. 
you can see that they started putting their ideas in. And here is one of my comments related to that diagnostic comment where I can tell them, okay, please check your spelling before you turn this in. So this was on vets. Vets can help. Vets can help dogs. They were able to work through that on their iPads. This was done on an iPad. Here's a sixth grade example focused on uh, Cleopatra. So we start to see that they're getting into developing their actual artistic style while also creating these graphic organizers. Um, as far as developing their literacy skills digitally, is it graphically pleasing is one of the questions that we could talk about. If they have to present this, can they read this when they get up to the whiteboard? Uh, the white text was important versus the black text because it didn't stand out as much with that background. So they start to learn these different qualities. Um, if I do have any art teachers in here, I get a comment all the time from my art teacher is how can I help support um, you in the classroom through art? And this is one of the great ways talking about those colors that we see what's pleasing together and what kind of colors can we layer on top of each other. So that was another thinking map. Um, one more thinking map that's very popular is the double bubble. If you haven't heard of that, it is just like a Venn diagram. Now on these digital graphic organizers, I am much more of a fan of the double bubble because it allows for a lot more space. In the Venn diagram, you're kind of limited because of that overlapping section. With this one, they could add more circles and just make sure that those lines are connected. So they know if it's connected, it's tied together and it's related to the main topic. So this is, Again, for comparing, they compared the three little pigs to the true story of the three little pigs. Now this lesson I've done um, with first grade all the way up to sixth grade, I think it's always very useful to get them engaged in just a simple way to start adding in pictures at the middle so that they start getting used to making sure that it's visually pleasing as well as making sure that they have the correct content to show that they've learned what I wanted them to master. All right, and then again, just seeing some differences with what we can see from what they know is a states of matter one. I love this one. I love to share it because one of my favorite things when students were creating this was the gas part. He said, can I add this um, <laughs> related to the fart? And I said, well, technically it is a gas. We can't see it, but we can smell it. So it was really interesting to see this opportunity because it gives them a chance to be playful, but they're not announcing it in class since it's digital and it's not on a poster. So it's okay for them to start doing this without it being distracting. We can start to see different parts of their personality come out and how it relates to their learning. Now the same grade level, fifth grade level, the student took a different approach. So it's also really great to start getting those examples where you can quickly pull up the differences in what type of level your students are at. So this student, um, went much more scientific with different types of gases that they would see, uh, different liquids. And I could tell that they pulled a lot of this from our actual notes that we've done in class. So as far as seeing what they remember from the content and from lessons, this is really useful to see how they apply it. All right, um, let's see, I've shown a couple of science examples. There are a lot on here. I wanna make sure that I save time for everything. So I am gonna go over here to an English one specific. Here's a main idea slide for sixth grade. So a lot of us use different graphic organizers. This is not a thinking map, but here we can start to see how we can move away from the pictures and start going into our actual routines. So in this one, they had the routine of claim, evidence, reasoning. They always had to make their claim in green. They always had to provide evidence in blue. And then lastly, provide some reasoning in red. And you can start to see those sentence frames, in my opinion, blank, or the author claims, blank. By the time they got the evidence based on the fact, blank. So you can start to develop these routines and routines are important in our classroom, but digitally, it's also important. So they know that if they see that green highlight, oh, I don't have a green sentence, I need to make sure that I 
state the claim that I'm noticing also. All right, and then if you're on this slide with me as well, if you click right here, there's going to be some templates. Templates are really great for lower grade and just for the beginning. I do encourage students to make their own from scratch. But if you go here, you'll have all the templates of what you've just seen. You can make a copy. Um, they're just blank slates for students to start with. And we're actually going to be working on creating our own uh, graphic organizer today as a student. So one thing that I love to do is start with the flow map. Um, depending on your level, you might want to choose something else. If you saw some kind of example that's related to your content area, I definitely encourage you to go to whichever organizer you're interested in. If you click on that flow map, you'll have a basic outline right here. And you could follow along with that. I am going to pull up a blank one to go over how I first introduce um, digital graphic organizers to any grade level. This will be a great activity for coming back from school. Now, to be able to follow along, a lot of you are probably used to this from Zoom. You're gonna make sure you have two windows, hopefully one where you can see me and one where you can get your graphic organizer ready. Oh, great, I already see some people popping on. Um, if you notice, this is a Google drawing and I do have Google Slides as well. Uh, the difference between the Google Drawing and the Google Slides is just if I want them to focus on one thing only, I love the drawing because it doesn't create an opportunity for them to make extra slides or get distracted by anything. Now, if I do have other goals for the day and I want it to be collected into one file, I add in the slides. Same kind of working. They get used to both. It's just whether it's going to be focusing on one thing or more. Um, how do you get to the files? on Google Drive. I will put in the chat that link. Here's the link to all of those organizers in the chat while everybody's getting ready. If you want to start on a blank document with me to follow along like as if you were a student starting fresh, you're going to go to your drive, select new, And I'm going to work in drawings just so that you guys can see. More of the space uh, slides is also. Going to have all the same controls, so either one you can select a slide or a drawing. If you want to try a drawing, you go down to more. And then you'll start to see the Google drawings pop up. One other benefit with Google Drawings is it does make it a little bit easier to create your own um, icons, or if you plan on making a digital graphic organizer, you can have a transparent background within the Google Drawings, and you can see that it's there because it has that um, checker box, so you know that you definitely have that transparent background before you download. All right, and then um, since this just take a second to set up, if you guys could just show me a thumbs up either on your camera or in the chat, showing me when we're ready. I'll wait for a few people to let me know. Let's see, thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Angela. If you're interested in trying Google Drawings, I will send you the direct link to a Google Drawing too. Yeah, usually if you just Google it, it'll also pop it up. All right, so going back to the presentation from here, you guys could just follow along with me. This is really just to reference to go back to. We're going to get really hands on. So you guys have already done the first step, going to your drive, creating a new doc that we're going to get started on. And the first thing to do is set up our background color. If you are on slides, there's always that button. 
at the top that says background. Now, if you're in drawings, I always just right click on my checker box and I see the word background come up. That does the same for slides too. So if you do not see the background button, you can right click on your slide and you see the background. So you can select your color. Let's see. If you want to try to make your own custom color, that's always a fun option. So you could click on that custom button that you see there, or you could just select a certain color that's already provided. So that's one of the first steps that I always make sure that students know how to do is make sure that they know how to do a background. Um, some students will quickly be able to throw in a background image, but with graphic organizers, I prefer to them to do a regular color so that it doesn't become distracting. And so I suggested we do a flow map, whether you wanna do a flow map on maybe your perfect summer, uh, your perfect day. A lot of the times I like to do my students' perfect day. One that would be great is summer coming back. But in here, I'm gonna do a teacher's perfect day. So we always need a title. I always like to insert word art for the title. I'm gonna to go to the top, insert word art. And then you're gonna get that text box to start putting it in. If you are on slides, there should be an A at the top for you to insert it quickly, but you can always go up to insert. Um, Amy, if you go down to more, do you see the option to, it should, then show Google Drawings after you go down to more. All right, and then with this word art again, um, students love the fact that they can do the two-tone colors. So the paint bucket will let you fill in. And then the pencil on the outline will let you outline it. Now to make that outline bigger, there's a border weight and I will come back to that, but you see the lines, you could just make it bigger and it will change the way that it looks. Um, Louise Foley, if you are on either a slide or a Google drawing, if you right click on the page, just the main section, you should have the background option like I just did. All right, and then um, after you know you start to change that borderline, a lot of students love to either add just partial parts. And this is really nice to talk about if they get up and start to present something. Well, when I put that on the screen, am I gonna be able to see this? Uh, Right now I'm seeing it pretty big on my monitor and it's not that easy to read. So I know now, okay, I'm just gonna keep it full, no spaces in my border. Again, with the fonts too, we all know that they love to find certain fonts. Um, I'm absolutely okay with them getting creative with their fonts, but we always have the discussion, can I actually read what you've decided to put up? Um, if you're ever curious for, you know, what's a good font that's always easy to read, I'm consistently using the Barlow Condensed on Google. Um, I know the fonts are very different. If you're used to buying fonts on PowerPoint, uh, Google's a little bit more limited in your font choices. So if you're ever looking for one, Barlow is a very easy to read um, block point font that I like to use for a lot of my school stuff. All right. And then from there, we're working on our perfect day. So we're going to be making sure that we show something flowing. So we wanna start inserting shapes. At the top, you should see a circle and a square. That is the quick way to insert our shapes. And once you select a shape, you're gonna see that plus icon. You're gonna click and drag. 
And with a lot of my students, especially lower grade students, they can absolutely make these. Uh, I've had first graders that make them. When they're on their Chromebook, I show them with my finger. I say, hold and drag. And I show them drag it back and forth before we undo it so that they can see the little icon moving back and forth so that they see that. And again, with their box, it's just like the fonts. So you can change the fill color. If you're going to be creative with it, especially upper grade, um, students will catch on to this very quickly. Going to custom, selecting a color, and then giving it a little bit of a transparent background is really useful for making sure that they can easily read the text that they're going to be putting in it. So if you notice that the backgrounds are too heavy, if you add that transparency, it gives it a little bit of an easier read level like I just made it just now. All right. Um, do I have any teachers in here that are, are still teaching on Zoom by chance? Let's see. Yeah, a couple. All right. So um, this is a good opportunity for you to jump on to your students' uh, presentations and work with them if you haven't done that before. So if I was doing this, I would give them a lot of downtime to get the opportunity to do the colors and just hop on there with them. And actually, they can see me doing it live at the same time. Um, let's see. Angela, thank you. Um, let me ask you. What's your question? Did it did it ask you to unmute? Yeah, oh, I was just saying I'm teaching online, but I, I forgot or can't find the background. I was doing this slide, then jump to the drawing. So what is oh, the background yeah. button? So the, the background, the easiest way um, is just on like the main page, right click, and then you'll see that background option. And is there another way? <laughs> um, I will actually, I'm trying to remember because it's, it's, you know, you become a teacher, a, a creature of habit. And, yeah, I just have a hard time right clicking on my pad, like on my yeah. map. Okay. Um, actually, does anybody have that answer? You know, it's funny on slides, the it button's out. right up there. Um, but I've become a creature of habit with drawings and I always right click. Um, Amy? Oh, okay, you're just showing me that you're on online probably. So no, I, I have a question. I don't have an answer for her. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a question Go for ahead. you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, oh, okay. So I am curious and, and sorry if I like miss this, but I've done this a little bit with my students and I've mostly used slides and the problem I've had happen is they can move what I've put in there and, and then it messes it all up. So how do you make a template that they can write in, that they can fill in, but they can't mess it up? but like they can't move the boxes all over the place or like it still stays within that template. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so I will be going over, like if you want it to awesome. be a hardcore I can one, wait, um, that's just my big question but, is I've done this sort of, but sometimes yeah. it's great and sometimes it's a disaster because the kids move the actual boxes and then the other kids are confused. Can I, can I ask you, uh, what grade level do you, do you teach? Um, I prime right now my online classes are um sixth and seventh grade, but I teach okay. K through 12. But that's and that's what I'm teaching this coming year. So it's middle school kids. So they're pretty technologically savvy. Um, yes. but it'd be better if pieces of it couldn't move and then but they could still yeah. So I'll own. go that I'll right. go over that. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's like um that's definitely why I have those templates too. And we'll talk about how to make those templates to where they cannot change it. Um, so going back to this real quick so that we make sure we have time overall, whenever you make a shape, if you right click into it, you can type right into the shape. And again, just like a Google Doc, you can highlight and change how the words look. So if you want it to be centered on mine, 
because my screen is small right now, my controls are set. If you ever see some missing controls, click on those three dots. Now I see all my options. I could bold my words. I can make sure that it's centered if I want it centered. And so now I have it how I would like it. Again, they can change the font of the text within the shape as well. Thank you to those of you that put in the chat how else to do it on the Mac. And then um, control C for copy, control V uh, for paste. I love this, but I forgot and I recently fell in love with control D for duplicate. So if I'm making that same shape over and over again, if I just hit control D, I don't have to hit do both steps. It just eliminates a quicker step. It gives me the exact same thing. And now I can add next. So I'm going to say there was um, first I get my Starbucks on the way to work. No traffic. And then I'm just going to put and one of the things that I really encourage with students is sometimes not to have full sentences in the graphic organizer. A graphic organizer is usually used for um, essay planning in, in a lot of the cases that I've used it where I don't want them to use full sentences. It's not needed always. Of course, as you get older, you want them to use those full sentences, uh, like the main idea one that I had showed you guys. So it just depends on what my goal is. For this one, it's almost like a movie scene with a flow map. I'm telling them, okay, first I got my Starbucks. There was no traffic, so I got the best parking spot when I got to work. Um, so now the important thing is I need to show those arrows. If you used a template, it's already there, and you can start moving them around. If you did not, we're going to go back up to that shapes, and we're going to select an arrow. All right, um, as you're working with this, you can start adding in images. So we're gonna go up to the mountains is what I like to tell all of my students. I just call it the picture of the mountains and search from the web. And so I'll, but first I'll search for a nice coffee picture. If you want something that will not have a background, having them search for, um, iced coffee p and g or you could just put transparent background that'll help them find that as well sometimes so i just get to search um i like looking within the slides for that um if i have any teachers that utilize seesaw the benefit of using google classroom and seesaw at the same time is if you want them to be able to easily add images on their own Google is going to make that easier. If they are creating this in Seesaw, they can do everything but grab images from Google easily unless it's already in their drive. Um, but if I have any Seesaw educators, it is also something that integrates really easily as well. All right, and then they could start layering their images. I like to have them sometimes within the box. We can have the opportunity to layer. And if they have an issue with, oh no, my picture's stuck behind the box, we could talk about how to bring that forward. Um, if you right click on your image or your box, there will be an order option. And you can see right there, there's the controls for hitting control and the up arrow will just bring it up to the top and then down, we'll bring it down to the bottom as well. A charity seesaw is um, like a Google Classroom. It's another opportunity for teachers to put up assignments. It's almost like a Google Classroom and a class dojo together. Um, I, if you are somebody that's interested in that, I always recommend seesaw and Google Classroom together. I love them both. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I said that for anybody that does use Seesaw. All 
All right, and while you guys are getting a chance to play with adding in those images, working with your colors, I'm gonna go back and just see if there's anything else. We've done word art already. We've done our background shapes and images. So this is our chance to get creative with it. Um, if you have questions right now, or you want me to go over anything related to building your outline, this is a great opportunity. Um, one thing I do have come up with my students about the flow map is how do we show where to go next when we run out of space? So if they're creating their own, I let them get creative, especially upper grade. Um, one of the arrows that you'll see. Um, sometimes is they'll use something like a curved arrow to show where to go. And I've always told them, as long as I can follow your track, almost like a racetrack, then it's easy for me. Now, um, this does get a little wild sometimes. So what I like to tell them is just like when we read a book, when you followed the end, you just go down to the next line. So then I would start making boxes down below. And so they follow it and read it like a book. All right, let's see, is there a way to insert just lines? Yes, um, in fact, I. so those of you that are interested in making it look like lines, there was some examples that I went over a little too quickly. So now that we have time, for those of you that are engaging with getting this practice, this is a great opportunity. Those of you that are um, curious about the lined paper, I'm gonna find an example for that as well. So in fact, um, I'll be going over this in more detail if you do come to my writing block. Um, it's called Transforming Writing Through Blended Learning. I have a lot of graphic organizers focused in on how we do um, writing in the classroom digitally also and how we can use the blended digital learning to help with that. Oh, um, so generally I like to have them do it in real time. If I was on um, Zoom, I would have them do it in real time because I can hop on with them. I could see what they're doing. If I um, am in the classroom, this is a really great opportunity at the beginning of the year. Okay, um, to pull up, you know, just a fun way to get them engaged so they could tell me about this. This is a good just getting to know you icebreaker um, way. And then we can slowly go over, okay, here's how you get to do this over and over again. They get that practice. Um, and, you know, at all age levels, I think this is really beneficial because there are a lot of students that um, they get to middle school and they just didn't have a lot of opportunities with this. Or they get to high school and they didn't have any of the creative opportunities where they didn't have a specific content goal. Um, so starting with this, helps them really set up for having these beautiful um, PowerPoints where they know how to do all of this and they can actually do presentations. Yes, um, so Charity, I'm gonna show you with my, my Starbucks right here real quick. I'm gonna make it bigger. She wanted to know, is there a way to get the picture to fit a shape perfectly? Um, so this picture right here, my Starbucks, if I want it to fit a certain shape, Let's say I want it to fit a heart because I love Starbucks. I'm gonna click on the picture. At the top here, it looks like the crop image icon on your phone, it's a mask. If you click on the side arrow, you're gonna have all these options to make it your picture into a shape. So of course I love teaching the kids how to do a heart. And you can start to edit the border too. 
once you do that. So now they can see that I really love my Starbucks. Um, and then, you know, if the heart doesn't work, I want it to fit right into this nice rounded box. I'll go back up and I can make it into a rounded box. So it gives it like a frame. And then I could just layer it on to fit perfectly. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. That was a great question. Um, if I have any AVID teachers, um, you can start to see this being helpful in a digital notebook. If you do start creating all of these opportunities for students to engage in slides, this is where I like to use slides. So here's an example of the digital notebook that I used with fifth graders when we were on Zoom. Um, here they had a three column note and they had to start inserting pictures related to their definitions and their terms. So here, she inserted her own pictures uh, so that she could go back to this in her test and actually reference it. And I love doing the pictures because it creates a quick reference. The reason that I love doing this on drawings is it already has images for them. A lot of the times on paper, you tell them to draw an image, but they still don't understand it. And they have to use their Chromebook anyways to look up something that's relevant. So it creates that opportunity for them to look it up and actually get a picture in their brain that they don't have to figure out how do I draw this building and they're worried about that kind of thing. Uh, where is the notebook? The notebook is on the graphic organizers um, and it's under geography. That's what this one is. And I can get you, um, if you have any problems with links, I can get you that at the end too. And the great thing about this, if you go through, you're gonna scroll through. Um, here's another three column note that she did, the student. And all of these background colors, she chose to do herself. So you're gonna start to see um, some differences in how they, oops, sorry. And how they start making it easier for them to choose to see it and read it. Oh, it looks like I'm having a little bit of a, let me just exit out of this, sorry. All right, I'll pull that back up for you guys. Taylor, there's a question in the chat. Um, Deborah would like for you to review how to fill shapes in with a picture. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my internet got a little bit slow for a second, so I'm glad you caught that. So I'll go back to the picture. Um, so on the picture, you click on it. And then at the top, you'll see an icon that looks a lot like your crop. Now, if you click on it, it'll have you crop it. But if you click on this little arrow on the side, it'll change the shape to whichever shape you select. Um, so right now I have it rounded, but I can make a heart. Um, let's see, I think I can even make a star in here. You just got to search for whichever one you like. Like I showed everyone, I really love the heart. And so they can start to see those changes. And once you've done the change, you can go to the pencil to um, to change the color of the border as well. Charlotte, I'm going to private message you that, that notebook so you'll be able to explore that. Hopefully that goes through to you. How do I make a copy of the notebook template? OK, um, the notebook template, I will get from my drive and send it from send it to you guys um, so that you can make a copy. It looks like I have it in presentation mode to go through. So if I could just um, if I could just get a reminder from Isamar, um, can I can you have remind me at the end to send the copy of the notebook? Sure. Thank you. That way they could make a copy for their drive. Um, in the chat, I did see a relevant question. So if you want to unmute yourself, I think it was something about maintaining the notebook. Here we go. How does a student set up that notebook and is it easy to maintain throughout the year? Um, this notebook part is where we will now travel to the part about, I want to create something where my students can edit it, but I don't want them to delete the important information. So in the notebook, um, if you guys get a chance to travel through it, 
you'll notice that there is a lot of setup involved with, I wanted them to specifically go to certain links and work through it, um, specifically insert different things. And it's a lot of different slides. So this was a, a complete unit and we re referenced it every day. Now, in order to make sure that they did not delete what I needed them to keep, I had to make sure to create static outlines where they cannot move it. So to do that, uh, one of the easiest ways to do it is create what you want and then download it like an image. After downloading it like an image, you can make it the background. So for example, right here, if I just want to make it an outline where they can't move these boxes and they could just type over the boxes, I'm gonna make it more generic. I'm gonna make it a flow map. And this is a good way to create expectations. So like somebody had said, well, I want them to do at least four events in their flow map, but if they can add more, I would love that. So I'm gonna make sure that they have some space to add their own ideas, but the minimum is four. So I've set that down here. And now that I've created it, I'm gonna go to file, download as an image. And then on my draw or on my slides now, I could make it the background. So let's see. So that's just one way. There are a couple videos on how to um, do it a little bit differently. This is my favorite way because I can just quickly put it up there. Um, and then if they lose it, there's a way to retrieve it as well. I'm gonna be going over version history and how to retrieve that. All right, so um, sorry for the, the lag, but I am now going to my slide. I'm gonna delete those boxes if I don't need them. And now I can go to the background. and upload that. Um, Aaron, if you could unmute yourself, um, what is your question? Um, I had kind of the same question about that notebook. Did you just make that whole template or is there, did you like, can we do our own notebooks like that? Or are you gonna show that? Or are we just gonna copy yours? <laughs> Oh, excellent question. Um, I do have a blank of that notebook completely. It was created by somebody called Slides Mania. So mm -hmm. if you if you guys have a chance, I would definitely check out Slides Mania. That person creates all kinds of different templates where it's cute little notebooks. And it's got all of the links where you can click on the tab and it takes you to the purple tab. And you can start editing your own titles in it as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so for the person that wanted something where they can't delete it, now that I've made it an image, I can't move these boxes. It can't be deleted unless they change the background. Um, and just to let them edit over, I tell them, okay, create a text box, put it over the box and start typing. Yeah, so the Slides Mania one, because it's um, multiple pages, that one you will do Google Drawings. I mean, Google Slides, sorry. Uh, 
Um, and then for those of you that want to make sure you remember how to make it so that they cannot change the background, it is on our slides on page eight. All right, um, now a lot of you have asked about lost work, especially with maintaining those, those notebooks. Um, version history is really important. Um, a lot of the times students will completely delete everything and panic, and then they start trying to do uh, Control-Z or undo over and over again. And it really kind of makes it hard to get their stuff back. So I always tell them to make sure to let me know that they've messed it up because I can always go back and change it. Um, another thing is if you have students that you have behavior management issues with, especially with collaboration, I have had students who put bad words in word art or say something in a comment. Uh, version history lets me see exactly who said something. So if I were to pull up something that my students had worked on together, Let's see, so I'm going to look for something they collaborated on. And I'll be going over this again also in my transforming writing through blended learning. But right here, if I go to this writing right here, and this will work in Google Slides as well. Now this one I pulled up specifically because it's in my drive. I know already that I have a student who reviewed somebody's work. If I click on the comments box, I can see all of the history of the comments that they've made from each other and who said what. And then if I go down to file, version history, I will be able to see um, who said what exactly. Um, it looks like it's taking a second to load. Let's see. So I'll have that do that in the background while I go over other comments. All right, what is the difference? Between, um, so Google Slides and Google Drawings are um, very similar. The only difference is uh, Google Drawings has an easier way to focus your students on one task because you can't add multiple slides. So if I only want them to focus in on one thing, I like the drawings. Now, if I'm doing something where there's going to be, they're building upon it, I'll do the Google slide. All right. Um, so an important thing with sharing in Google, um, there are a few things that you can do. First, if I'm sharing with you guys, if I'm sharing with another educator, especially maybe my friend that's in a different district, I want to make sure that they can actually access it. So my district, if I go to share something in my drive, um, you click on that share button, you're going to notice that it might say add people. And at the bottom where it says get link, always in my uh, district drive, it says anyone at Paris or restricted. And if you click on change, there's an option to do anyone on the internet can find and view if you give that link. That makes it so that you can share it with people outside of your district. Um, so we can get that um, inner district collaboration going. Um, it also makes it so the parents can see work at home. I love to make sure that if I'm highlighting the student, um, 
I can actually send them that without having to create a special QR code. So I could just send the link on ClassDojo or Remind and they can actually see what their student has done. So always changing that share option. If you Taylor, you're muted. Ah, thank you. Um, I do not know when I muted. So um, I was talking about sharing in Google. Um, did I go over that completely? You Sorry, cut off right after that. Okay, great. Um, my internet's starting to slow down just a little bit. Uh, so sharing in Google, um, one of the things that I like to do is make sure that everybody can view it. Uh, it. A lot of the times districts will make it so that it's restricted. So when you go to the share button, if you see the get link option, you're going to want to change that to anyone can view on the internet. If you plan on sharing it with people outside of your district, um, I like to share a lot of things with parents, especially if I want to send like a quick, they're doing great in class note, or also make things easy for parents to see for parent conferences. Then you want to make sure that you click anyone on the internet can be find and view. Also, as you start to add people, you can start changing their editing rights. So if at first you accidentally allow some students to edit and they start changing your work how you don't want it, you can then go into that and change it to view only as well. All right, so we already worked on creating your own. Um, if you want to be able to explore different content areas of what people have created, click on this uh, share your graphic organizer here. And then it'll take you to the website that's just housed some of the graphic organizers that teachers have created. Uh, so we've got different bubble maps, flow maps, tree maps, and other right here. Um, so if you're curious what people have created, I think I've seen some really great high school level science maps in here. Um, so you can explore through those. That's where I was saying, if you set your uh, settings to anyone can find and view, we can start to create these opportunities for us to get different ideas from other people. So all these people from, it looks like they're in Desert Sands, they made sure their settings were set correctly. And now I can see what ideas they came up with for their classroom. And I could even make a copy. Um, so this one, uh, this was one of the ones I was hoping to bring up. This was protein synthesis. Um, it was really unique because can have R, uh, generally a lot of teachers think that it's only for lower grade. Um, so I was really excited to see an upper grade student or teacher come up with this. So DNA can blank, DNA has blank, and DNA is blank. Um, this is probably a great review. And a lot of the times I like to let students use their digital graphic organizers on a test. So if they let them come up with this. This is a good way to see what they remember and they can review it. They also have a flow map in here for the translation process as well. Yes. So to quickly see other templates that other educators have made, besides the one that I showed you guys at the beginning, on slide 11, where it says share your graphic organizer here, it'll take you to the website. It talks about how you can um, share yours. So it goes over, make sure that you have the anyone can view. You go to the type it is. So I've got bubble maps. You could submit it there. And then to view, you just click on view. So you'll find the map you want to do. If you don't find the one, a lot of people are putting it under other. And then these will start to generate as people add them. Um, so over the years, you'll start to see more. I've done this presentation. This is my second time so far. So hopefully we'll get some more added. Let's see, it looks like. Somebody actually added one just now. Thank you, Danielle. So 
So you'll be able to go and get different ideas if you want to be able to use it in your classroom. Click make a copy and you can take that and use it in August. Or I don't know if anybody starts here. Do I have any year round people? So taking it to the classroom, um, a lot of us probably utilize Google Classroom. So if you're used to making an assignment, you're going to go to Classwork, create an assignment, and you're going to click on the Drive tool to search for the template you've already created. And make sure to click Make a Copy for Each Student so that they do not um, mess up your design. They also all have their own. And then if you want to challenge your older students, though, to start from the beginning, like a couple of you guys did, I tell them to go to the assignment and they click add or create, and then they select um, whatever they're going to add, whether it's a slide or a drawing. Yes, I can put the link in the chat for the website. That is a great idea. Sorry. All right, so that link I just posted has that website that has other maps that other educators have created during this presentation. And then um, lastly, if you have any questions, I have my email up there, uh, my Twitter. I do ask that you guys please review the session so um, I could edit this as time goes on, I noticed that I really had to go back and edit this because I did this pre-COVID and post-COVID. So it um, has really changed since Zoom has happened. And then this is a great opportunity for questions. I know there's a lot of different uh, templates that I need to grab those links for, and I'm going to be working on that if you guys have time to stick around for a second. All right. And thank you so much.